Well, as uh, mentioned this morning, we've switched out the themes. The morning went to the discussion about um, about uh, open fellowship and uh, the writings of Ed Harrell that we were referring to in the share drive earlier. I can share that with you later if you need. Um, we at this time are talking about evidences where we have been talking about evidences in the mornings, but I think this might be useful to you all this evening. Um, so hopefully uh, it will be, and I, I do want to hear from you what, uh, if, if you think it's, it's not. <laughs> so let me know. Um, it's genuine good faith effort here, but could be wrong. I have definitely been wrong before. So, in the series on evidences, we've come to the part where I take the negative. There have been a number of, I think, positive uh, lessons putting forth the uh, proofs that the Bible gives of itself. The things that show that it is true, that it is of human, or rather that it is of divine origin, not human. The proofs of nature that illustrate that God does exist that are available to all of humankind in the sky and in the earth, in the cycles and seasons. But this one's a negative, this is an against, and, and I think it needs to be said as well because of what is so often offered up as evidence for the Bible. And by this we mean very often people will put forth something of uh, purported science. They'll do us a lesson about evolution or a lesson of some other biology topic. Um, or I heard a guy doing one in uh, medicine, uh, and Emily might remember, but we heard a guy doing one in medicine where he went through the law of Moses um, and he went through Egypt. And it's interesting, you know, all of it's interesting, but none of it biblical. But he basically went through showing how um, you know, the medical arts of the Egyptians are documented and we know that they were hogwash, <laughs> but that uh, the things that are in the uh, Law of Moses are also documented and they are true, but that, you know, if you think Moses wrote it, he didn't because he was brought up in Egypt in Pharaoh's house and taught all this. Anyway, it's an interesting lesson, sort of, sort of. Um, what we call hogwash is based on our own uh, viewpoint of what is good medicine. And I'm sure that, uh, you know, three, four thousand years from now, they'll call what we're doing hogwash. <laughs> so, who's right? Uh, that's the problem <clears throat> when you do things like that. So, I thought it would be good to talk about this. I realized, too, that we we're also under attack. Um, and, and these things are brought forward as reasons or rationale that we ought to be looking at that are reasons to disbelieve, basically. So I thought it would be good to look at that from a biblical perspective. First thing, though, we should define the science, right? Let's talk about science for a minute. Science is fine. Science is good. <laughs> it's great at what it does. It's good for what it's for. And... I am a subscriber to it. I am not one of the guys. I, I mean, I won't even go to a chiropractor, you know? <laughs> like, I'm so strict. <laughs> and I know there's probably a chiropractor who's very offended. Look, you know what I'm talking about. If you're a chiropractor, you're no stranger to the idea that people don't consider that Western medicine. <laughs> so, it's just a little bit of levity to say I'm on board with the science. 1 Timothy 6, the warning, though, is 20 to 21, the thing that is falsely called knowledge, and this is not just a, a thinly veiled rhetorical device. I'm aware of those things. Listen to what he's saying. And, and then listen to what I'm saying. I do not know why that keeps happening to this projector. Uh, 1 Timothy 6, 20 to 21, he said, Paul said to Timothy, guard the deposit entrusted to you, avoid the irreverent babble and contradictions of what is falsely called knowledge. By professing it, some have swerved from the faith. 
grace be with you. Now, he may have in mind uh, some of the teachings that were false, some of the genealogies, um, but I don't think he does. Timothy's at Ephesus. He's not among Judaizing teachers overly much the way that, say, Galatia was. I think he's talking about the thing that you and I are talking about, the thing that is falsely called knowledge. And this is where you have to understand what's really underneath that word knowledge, which I've got highlighted here. The reason um, for going down this path is that these science and technology, these are words, and they're just words. I'm not saying that science isn't real or that it doesn't have a use or that it's not defined and doesn't have a lingo. I'm saying it's just a word, though. You, you've got to understand it's a word. Science is. It's a word that in the English language entered somewhere around 1300 to 1350 AD. Um, it came to us by way into Middle English at that time, of course, but came to Middle English by way of Middle French. And the French got it by way of Latin, which, you know, they spoke in Rome. <laughs> the Romans called it scientia, that is, knowledge. It's the equivalent of scient, stem of scients, which is the present participle of skire, to know. But scientia becomes science. It's just a Latin word, and the word means knowledge. So you got to understand, they chose this word to describe what they were doing. The, the scientists chose to use this word to describe what they were doing, because everybody in an academic context, in a medical context, was using Latin. That doesn't mean that it is knowledge. That doesn't mean that it's better knowledge. In and of itself, it's just a term that describes what they're trying to do. Technology is the same way. This one is from Greek, though. Techno and logo, or logos. This didn't come into our language until modern English, 1600s. Somewhere around King James Version, 1605, 1615. Technology, which is from Greek. Technologia, which is a systematic treatment of something. Meaning using a system to treat something. Specifically, techne is the Greek word for art or skill. Trade, you know, an artisan. Something that you know how to do. In uh, modern, uh, you know, maybe gangster basketball lingo, it's money. That's money. And logi comes to us by way of Middle English, which also came, instead of from French, they got that one straight from Latin, which is straight from Greek. <laughs> <laughs> the French log, also from Latin logos, which is also straight from Greek. Logos. The logos itself comes into our language just before King James. And logos in Greek is a very large thing that is hard to define, but it's a word, a saying, a speech, or discord, discourse, a thought, a proportion, ratio, reckoning. It's rationale, uh, really. This, the logos is a difficult thing. Um, well, I shouldn't say difficult. It's a very large topic and uh, something that gets treated seriously in philosophy and in the study of the language. It's an important matter. <coughs> So, this is to say, the saying, the speech, the ration, uh, or rationale, rather, the thought of art, skill, ability to accomplish a thing, that's technology. Skientias is knowledge or know-how. And as I said, they're good in and of themselves. They're good for what they do and for what they are needed for. Let's discuss for a moment the scientific method, which again, I will, you know, betray my own uh, prejudices. I am for. 
I like the scientific method. I do not, I have not had people put, you know, poke needles into me and talk to me about chakras. Uh, it might work. And I'm, you know, I'm sure if I were in pain and every Western thing didn't work, I would try it. That's fine. Because, hey, Western isn't absolute. Uh, you know, we make fun of what they did 400 years ago, and 400 years from now, they will make fun of us too, assuredly. But the scientific method relies on observable, repeatable phenomena, things that happen. They must happen. But they must be observable, and they must be repeatable. Now, here I went to Encyclopedia Britannica, just to make sure that I was steering clear of American politics. And it says a typical application of the scientific method means the researcher develops a hypothesis. The researcher tests that hypothesis by various means. And the researcher will modify the hypothesis on the basis of the outcome of those tests and the experiments, you know, rigged to perform those tests and to get the outcomes that would, if, essentially this is data, this is information about how does that hypothesis work or not work. The modified hypothesis will be subjected to the review again. It's retested, this is recursion. Uh, in order to understand recursion, you must first understand recursion. The modified hypothesis is retested, further modified, tested again until it becomes consistent with observed phenomena, by which we mean that seems to be true <laughs> because it's predictable, it's consistent, it describes everything that we are able to observe. This, this is perfect, I got no problem with this. That is, to me, this is the way that we do medicine. We have, you know, I think the West has the best medicine that at least is available in the world today. Um, you know, modern policies wrecking things and destroying our faith and our institutions, notwithstanding, <laughs> we have hitherto eradicated, all but eradicated, a number of deadly diseases. We have longer lives. We are preserved alive. My own wife was preserved alive, if you will, by the scientific method, the advances in medical science that made it possible to help her from infancy. Um, yeah, we benefit from this. I think it's great. I'm for it. There is, though, a limitation to what it is useful for. And I'm just going to go straight for the throat. Science cannot explain resurrection from the dead. Jesus Christ is resurrected from the dead. And this is the proof that God has given that he is the Son and that we ought to make him our king and live according to his reign. But science cannot explain that. Why is that? Well, because it's not an observable, repeatable phenomenon. It's something that is attested to us by those who knew him personally, dozens and hundreds of them, according to the New Testament. So we know that. But there's not an observable, repeatable phenomenon that can be checked against a hypothesis, which is to say, well, resurrection could happen if, if we could set these parameters, if we could cause, put these things into motion, we can bring something that has died back to life. No, that's not going to exist. It's not repeatable. It's not observable. So it's just not possible. They're, they're unlike things. You can't, you know, it's just not helpful to you to try and reason that way. And uh, like I say, I'm going straight for the throat in the sense, uh, I guess, in the theological sense. Because people tend to have problems with creation, uh, whether God created the world the way he said he did in the time frame that he said he did. Um, probably because of the popularity of discussions about the age of the earth right now in the larger community. But that's not the biggest problem you have. 
if you're worried about those things. The biggest problem you have is resurrection from the dead. It's not possible. It can't be done. And this Jesus, who is resurrected, was dead, and he was real dead. I mean, Rome was not nice. What happened to him, there was no recovery from that. From the, you know, the beating he received at the hands of his kinsmen may have been enough when he was beaten, you know, by the guards around the high priest. That might have been enough to kill him. Certainly, when he was beaten while blindfolded by the Roman garrison, together with the previous beating, that'd be enough for concussion. When they tie him to the post and flog him so that, you know, quivering strands of muscle and flesh are hanging off of the back in an age where there are no coagulants and there are no sutures. Yeah, you're dead, buddy. <laughs> that you you got no choice now that's it you're out of here you have no skin on your back half of your body is is exposed again there's no blood transfusions there's there's no sutures uh, there's, there's there's no you know nah nothing they can do he's dead but they didn't stop there either they did a whole bunch of other things so no he was dead how are you going to bring that back to life uh, there's no real scientific explanation we cannot repeat that we cannot observe that we can come up with no hypothesis working within the framework of our existence in, in physical reality here that would explain this no it's not possible but matthew 19 records in the 26th verse with man salvation is impossible but with god all things are possible so yeah we don't explain it. We cannot repeat it. We cannot do it. But God can. With God, all things are possible. And it makes sense that he who created the universe, who created the uh, rules by which we are governed, whether that be physical space or time or any other thing, he must be higher than those things. He must be greater than those things. He, he himself is not bound by the things that he created by his own hand. You can know that he is eternal, that he is divine, that he is powerful. Yeah, sorry, this projector does not like me. <laughs> I might try a different projector next time, sorry. Um, but with God, all things are possible. I'm going to make another comment here, which is perhaps controversial, but, you know, this is my, my thought about the matter, and I would offer it to you as my judgment as a person who has been involved in this, who's very sincere in the faith. When we dive into science, philosophy, technology, things of this nature, and try to use them against critics of the church, we are the only ones who are being fooled by that. Okay? It, and I'll give you an example or a few examples, nothing that's uh, personally identifiable, okay? Because I'm not trying to attack people. But I want you to understand the futility of that and not to go down that path and lose, um, well, in some sense, lose credibility, but really, it's hurting the mission. Our purpose is to point people to the scriptures, let them read the Bible for themselves, and draw the conclusions. It, that works for you, why doesn't it work for everybody else? That's what we're supposed to do. I, I did hear a fella talking about philosophers <clears throat> um, and, you know, talking about the history of philosophy because he wanted to make the point that it was futile and that human learning was uh, a futile um, effort and did not bring value to the church or to the understanding of the Bible, which all of which is just not really accurate. Um, certainly there are limits. To what we can do and what we can know but that doesn't mean they're useless and it doesn't mean that they cannot be used in the service of god either um, and i remember how everybody you know with whom i interacted about that teaching spoke very highly of, of the of the uh, fella saying he seemed to be very learned uh, his speech was very persuasive with them and 
you know, they, they felt that this would be useful to them in their discussions with their friends and things of this nature. Um, but the truth is, I studied philosophy um, as part of my classics education at the university, and uh, that guy mispronounced several philosophers' names. Now, what it tells you, I don't mean to attack the guy or to say he's a bad guy, I'm saying, why would you present yourself as an expert in a field when you are not? And then you do something like present a lesson like this and you can't even pronounce the names correctly. It's manifestly foolish. So any real philosopher who was actually struggling with these things or thinking about these things, thinking that they had an advantage or an upper hand because of these thoughts, easily dismisses out of hand whatever this gentleman says because he doesn't know what he's talking about, obviously. That's an example. <laughs> there are others that are like it. And I think that's important. I know that, you know, one of the guys that goes around talking about uh, evolution or it's not evolution. He talks about, well, no, he does talk about that, but he's talking about the fossil record. One of the fellows that goes about the churches and, uh, you know, again, I, I'm sure you would know his name and I'm not interested in attacking the fellow. We're just trying to make the point. Um, you know, advertises on his flyers that he is a doctor. Doctor so-and-so will be speaking on these things, right? Well, he's a doctor of dentistry. He's a medical doctor. He is not a professor of biological sciences um, or geology or, or any other relevant field to the topic. And even if he were, what has that got to do with the Bible? What does that have to, go, to do with salvation in Jesus Christ? Nothing. What, why is that in the churches? Where, what business is that? do we have with that? Um, I don't know enough about those fields to know what he's getting wrong, but I know enough to know that I don't go to a dentist when I have questions about the fossil record. That's just how that is. So real experts are not alarmed. <laughs> they're not disarmed. They're, they're not worried when people prop up false knowledge. Um, you know, do some kind of cursory introductory reading into a subject just to tear it down. Uh, that kind of a scarecrow rhetorical approach, unfortunately, is about as deep as most quote-unquote evidences, lessons go. And so that's why I'm against them. Again, this is a negative lesson. The positive lessons are on YouTube. Please look those up. <laughs> the Bible does present proof of itself. And the Bible does present um, evidences to us that are in nature, that are available to all of humankind. Uh, again, these are past lessons, and I encourage you to look at them, but this evening we continue with the scriptures, because I'm never going to stand up here and talk philosophy, history, opinion, um, and leave it at that. I think it's useful for us to talk a little bit candidly about those things, so that we don't fall prey to those traps. But the Bible is why we come together. God is why we are here. The Lord is who is to be honored, not us. So faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Here's what the Bible says about the matter. First of all, the proofs that the Bible provides are the only proofs that there are. <laughs> That's an important thing. People want to find that ark. You know, they're always looking for the ark of Noah. And they're always looking on Mount Ararat. I don't know why. I said, well, because the Bible says it's there. No, it doesn't. It says it was in the mountain range of Ararat. We don't know what mountain it was on. <laughs> it's in there somewhere, probably, if it even exists. How do you know he didn't disassemble it or burn it? And why do you need it? What's it going to prove if you find it? Couldn't somebody who read this have erected, had made one and set it there so that you would find it and think that was the real one? I'd be more inclined to think that a phony could be found and used by the devil as some kind of a shrine 
or a site um, or some way to get to encourage people to keep arguing like this before I would believe that God would let you actually find the real one for what it's worth. The Bible's proofs are the only proofs. Luke 16 is the place we go now. Let's look at this. As promised. The Lord told us about two persons who died and what happened to them after the fact. And it's a very important matter because the old, or I'm sorry, one of the individuals wanted to warn his family who were still alive. And this is a pressing matter with regard to evidences. The account of Luke 16, 19 to 25 begins, there was a rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen who feasted sumptuously every day. At his gate was laid a poor man named Lazarus, covered with sores, who desired to be fed with what fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, even the dogs came and licked his sores. That's pretty wretched. I want to note that this man, Lazarus, is at the gate of the man who fares sumptuously this is not prejudice against wealth, and it's not um, bias towards poverty, both of which are condemned in the law. It's saying there is a poor man, and we know his name, and somebody else knows his name too. It's the rich man who sits in there and eats well. There's a poor guy named Lazarus at my gate covered in sores, who gets attacked by the dogs every day. And what do I do about it? Nothing. He did nothing. That's what this is actually about. The dog came and licked his sores. This poor man died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried. And that tells you the story, doesn't it? The poor man died and is carried by the angels. The rich man died and was buried. That tells you how this is going to go. In the underworld of the dead, being in Tartarus, that is, in torment, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham far away, and Lazarus at his side. And he called out, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus to dip the end of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am in anguish in this flame. He knows who Lazarus is. But see, he knew who Lazarus was when he was alive, too. And he didn't do anything to help him. That man laid at his gate, longing to eat just whatever fell from the rich man's table. The thrown away pieces of chicken or the loaves of bread, whatever fell, he wanted to eat that. And dogs came and licked his sores. This guy gave him no food, gave him no bandages. Probably didn't even give him a stick to shoo away the dogs. But now he wants Lazarus to give him some water because he is in torment and flame. Abraham says, child, remember, you in your lifetime received your good things. Lazarus in like manner, bad things. Now he is comforted here and you are in anguish. Again, this is not saying it's a sin to be wealthy, nor is it saying that poverty exonerates every wrong deed. He's saying... It was in your hands to right these wrongs when you lived, and you did not do so. You took the good things in your lifetime and left the bad ones to Lazarus. That's what he's saying. So, 27th verse, <clears throat> the rich man, and this is the part that has to do with evidences. The rich man says, I beg you then, Father, send Lazarus to my father's house. For I have five brothers, so that he may warn them, so that they do not also come to this place of torment. All right, now he knows his family, who are still on the earth, who are still alive, are in danger of doing exactly what he has done, and joining him in torments in the afterlife. He says, okay, at least let's stop them from coming here. Which... This is the truth. If you're worried about, you know, mom and dad didn't believe this, you know, grand, uh, you know, nanny and pappy didn't believe this, 
you know, I don't want to condemn them. Look, it's not up to you what, what they did in their lives. It's not up to you whether they're saved. And if this text tells us anything, it tells us that if they lost their souls, they don't want you to lose yours. Uh, for, uh, a friend of mine said, <laughs> he, he told his dad, his dad was not living right. He told his dad, I love you and I'll love you to the end, but I'm not going to go to hell for you or anybody else. That's true. That's the fact. So this man says, go warn them. Send Lazarus. Abraham said, they have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear that. What is that? It's the Bible. They have a Bible. He said, no, Father Abraham, if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. As in, they knew who Lazarus was too? Yeah. They knew who Lazarus was. They let him lay there and did nothing for him, just like this man did. They're brothers. So now he wants to warn them that they shouldn't be doing that. But you don't get that. If someone goes to them from the dead, they'll repent. And Abraham's response is our lesson. If they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced if someone should rise from the dead. The, the miracle, you know, might be notable, but they would find a way to explain it off. The same way that they explain away God's word. If the Bible doesn't work, nothing's going to work. That's what he's saying. If the Bible doesn't work, nothing's going to work. My job is not to convince you. My job is to help you see what the Bible says. To encourage you to read the Bible for yourself. It's God who does that work. And if that doesn't work, I don't have anything that's going to help you. I can't convince you using whatever it is. Science, rhetoric, charm. No matter how much charm I admittedly may have. <laughs> uh, who are we kidding here? <laughs> No, there's nothing I can do that's going to help you, right? The Bible's the only thing. And what he said is very important. I had this conversation with a friend um, who is an atheist who was raised in the church, actually. Um, you know, and he said, look, if you could levitate or something, you know, I would have to listen to what you're telling me. I'm like, no, no, you would, no, you wouldn't. And he said to me, why do you say that? What kind of monster do you think I am? What do you mean? <laughs> you don't believe what the Bible says. And the miracles that you talk about. I mean, this levitation thing is paltry to compare, compared to what happened. In the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. You don't believe that. Why would you believe me? And what would I tell you anyway? You don't need to listen to me. You need to listen to the Bible. He got very upset with me about that, but that's what the Bible says in Luke 16, 31. If they don't hear Moses, they won't be convinced, even if somebody rises from the dead. And you know, this is true of Jesus himself, who was not accepted by most of his countrymen. True. He's not accepted by most of the world. It's not that they are different or special in some way. I will not accept any Israel bashing. It's just the way of the world. The other thing the Bible tells you is that God made the message foolish. It is intentionally, in some sense, foolish in the eyes of the world. 1 Corinthians, Paul the Apostle writes to Corinth, a, which is a Greek city-state. The philosophers were there. The learnedness was there. If you know Greek, and, and that is my, my degree, I'm not bragging, just saying, you can tell Corinth is an educated, um, you know, Paul is educated in his uh, discourse. Uh, you can see it especially in Romans and in uh, First and Second Corinthians and in Hebrews. Um, but uh, that's why he wrote to them, I think, the things that he wrote, which we now read. The 18th verse of the first chapter, he said to them, the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing but to us who are being saved it's power it's the power of god one and the same message the word of the cross 
is to some people folly, to other people the power of God. What's the difference? Well, it's the parable of the sower. The same seed goes everywhere, but what kind of ground does it land on? What is my heart like when I hear the word of God? Do I accept it? Do I allow it to grow? Then the 21st verse, Since in the wisdom of God the world did not know God through wisdom, it pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. Now this is the truth. I, I am not, you know, I'm not anybody. This is folly. <laughs> Listening to me, following me, taking advice from me, that's folly. Don't do it. But look at the Bible though. Look what that says. The world didn't know God through wisdom. It knows him in some other way. See, it pleases God, or he decided, that we would come to know him through the folly of what is being preached. And this continues, Jews demand signs, Greeks seek wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified. The stumbling block to Jews, folly to the nations, but to those who are called, whether they're Jews or Greeks, Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. What we mean by this is there are people who believe in God, who are perhaps religious, who are pious. That is the quote unquote, the Jews who demand signs. Then there are people who do not believe in God, who are very disposed to the science, the philosophy, the technology, thinking that that somehow supplies the spiritual needs of humankind. Those are the quote unquote, Greeks. The Jews demand signs. The Greeks seek wisdom true. Religious people want to see some kind of power. They want to see something. They want it to be something. Whereas, you know, the critics, the atheists, the um, skeptics of the world are looking for wisdom. They want to be right. But we preach Christ crucified, which is, <laughs> well, it's both a sign and wisdom, but not in their eyes. A stumbling block to Jews and folly to the nations. It's a stumbling block to the Jews because they expected him to do something powerful like come down from the cross um, or reign on earth, be a king, have a kingdom that conquers all the other kingdoms of the world. People still think that way, by the way. That's wrong. He didn't come to do that. He said, my kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight. But for the Greeks who seek wisdom, it is folly because, you know, Rome only crucified the worst of people. And it's folly to them because resurrection is impossible. So we crucified him. Yeah. And everybody agrees we crucified him. Yeah. But you say he's alive? And uh, they'll say, well, yes. And, <laughs> you know, a doubtful Roman citizen, a doubtful Greek, would say, uh, uh, you know, there's something wrong with you, friend. That, that's not possible. Right? That's what we mean. It's folly. But to those who are called, Jews or Greeks, don't matter. If you're listening to the word of God, then Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. The foolishness of God is wiser than men. The weakness of God is stronger than men. Important. <clears throat> Excuse me. Important to think about this. Um, what is considered foolish, what is considered weak, is actually better. What God does is better, though we may or may not understand. We may or may not agree. Our observations and our repeatable phenomena may not reach the same conclusions, but God is right about this. And I still ask, why? Are science and technology believable, but the Word of God has to be proven? Why can't it be the other way? In 1 Corinthians 1, 26 to 29, here's the next thing he says, which gets kind of personal. Consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many of you were powerful. Not many of you were of noble birth. And, and that's true. As a rule, we are not made of the governing body. Here we are in, this, in the seat of state government. 
in admittedly the greatest state in the union, but where are where are they? Where are the, the senators, the representatives, the governor, the lieutenant governor, the attorney general? Where are they? Why aren't they in here? This is what's important. This is what matters. But no, that's not usually what happens. What happens is God chose what is foolish in the world to shame what is wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame what is strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that do not exist, to bring to nothing things that do. So that no human being might boast in the presence of God. <laughs> this is all about humility. We've got to be humble. He does this so that we don't think too highly of ourselves. And I know what you're thinking. There's nobody in the state capitol who thinks too highly of themselves. I understand. I, I get that, that concept. But, but truly, the Lord intends for all of us to humble ourselves before him. He is power. He is wisdom. We can do some things and we should. And you should make use of some things and you should improve yourself and take advantage of opportunities to learn, to grow, to apply science, technology, philosophy, uh, classics, literature. That's all good. But understand, it all mean nothing to God. <laughs> and he doesn't need any of it. Finally, 1 Corinthians chapter 2. And then this is done. Uh, not quite. But yeah, it is. I mean, it's 1 Corinthians 2. We start with verses 1 through 5. What does Paul do? He says, When I came to you, brothers, I didn't come proclaiming the testimony of God with lofty speech or wisdom. I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. What he means by this is I determined ahead of time. Before I left here to go to Corinth, I decided ahead of time I am an expert in no field except Jesus Christ and him crucified. That's what I know. And that is the thing that we're calling for. I wish that people would do this. You're not fooling anybody but yourself. I was with you, said Paul, in weakness, in fear, in much trembling, which is a quotation of how Moses was before the Lord when the Lord appeared to him in the burning bush. He had much fear and trembling my speech my message were not implausible words of wisdom but in demonstration of the spirit and power why so your faith may not rest in the wisdom of men but in the power of god and i'm afraid this is the thing that has overcome far too often people really want those dynamic speakers they want the great uh, arguments they want the great rhetoricians to be speaking to them. Well, they wouldn't have hired Paul. <laughs> I dare say they wouldn't have hired Jesus either. He continues, among the mature, though, we do impart wisdom, though it's not a wisdom of this age or the rulers of this age who are doomed to pass away. We impart a secret, a hidden wisdom from God. No, not a conspiracy. He's saying it's just, it's not the obvious thing which God decreed before the ages for our glory. None of the rulers of this age understood this because if they had, they wouldn't have crucified him, the Lord of glory. That's all we're getting at. It's not some grand scheme or conspiracy. It's, he's just saying, we're talking about the thing that the Bible has foretold and what God has done here before our eyes. Their eyes, I should say. Not you and me. I saw nothing. I wasn't there. And the 14th verse, the key to this is the natural person, that is, the person who sees only nature. Perhaps the person who is only willing to use the scientific method to ascertain truth does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, their folly to him. He can't comprehend them because they're spiritually discerned. I remember a friend of mine speaking to me about the Gospels when we were in high school still. Yes? Yeah. He said, how can the dead bury their dead? If you're dead, you can't do anything. And I, honestly, I said to him, how can you not understand that? 
That's a figure of speech, obviously. The dead can't do anything. But we just went in circles. He was like, yeah, exactly. The dead can't do anything. That doesn't make any sense. Why would you say that? I'm like, friend, are you serious? You don't get this? Well, no, they didn't. Because the natural person doesn't accept the things of the Spirit of God. He wasn't willing to look at spiritual things. I'm not saying because you don't understand it, you're going to a devil's hell, you know, in high school, it, your life course is set before you. No, I'm not saying that. That is what he did. He ended up becoming an atheist. But um, he didn't get it because he was not interested in getting it. That's the thing. The natural person doesn't accept the spiritual things. You know, to me, the spiritual things are, in some sense, they're an inconvenient truth. At this point, of course, I've dedicated myself to it, but when I first came across these things uh, at uh, whatever it was, 15, 16 years old, and read the Bible for myself for the first time, that was a pretty inconvenient truth. <laughs> but it was also a pretty undeniable truth. The Bible is right. God does exist. He has made himself clear. I can know what is right. I can find out what is right. I can be held accountable for the level of effort that I put towards this. That's inconvenient, but it's true. So, that's where we are. That's, that's, that's where we are on evidences. I would say to you friends, leave aside the you know, leave aside these false knowledge lessons about science or philosophy or whatever it else, whatever else it is that you purport to be an expert in. I heard a guy talking psychology, talking about the release of dopamine and uh, other neurotransmitters and how they are related to current scientific thinking about addiction and, you know, he couldn't pronounce the terms correctly. Like, it's one of these. Like, why, why are you doing this? Why are you talking about this? What is this for? Why do you need it? So we're back to the best evidences are the only evidences. The things that the Bible says about itself. The things that the Bible offers for us. And Jesus is resurrected from the dead. And we are accountable for the things done in the body, whether they're good or evil, because God has given us a word that we can and must understand. Take it to heart. And I'd encourage you to do it for yourself. Read the Bible. I'm not afraid of that. I want you to do that. People are afraid. Like, oh, I'm going to draw the wrong conclusions. Why would you think that? Do you think God is trying to trick you? Do you think he wants to trip you up? Do you think he's not your friend? He doesn't want you to succeed? He doesn't know how the human mind works. He doesn't know how logic works or language. You think so? I don't. That's preposterous. Of course you can understand it. Of course he wants you to understand it and to do it. He wants, to ple wants you to please him. He wants you to live for him and glorify him. And he wants to bless you too. It's a good life. It's the best life. No, not the easiest life, but it's the best life. And it has the best retirement, of course, <laughs> in heaven. Well, today, if you're not a Christian, we talk about this every time we come together. In the New Testament, they were commanded to be baptized in the name of Christ Jesus for forgiveness of sins. In Acts 10, you see Peter speaking with Romans for the first time. And he called for water and commanded them to be named in the, or to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for forgiveness of sins. That's Acts 10, 47 and 48. That hasn't changed. That's what we do. That's how you become a child of God. You repent of your sins. You believe, you believe in God. You have faith towards God. You've got to turn in your heart. Turn over a new leaf. You're going to serve God from now on. If we can help you with our prayers, we're glad to do it. As a Christian, if you haven't lived right, we'll pray for you based on your repentance. If today we can help you with our prayers, we can help you to obey the gospel of Jesus. Let the need be known before it is forever too late.